And we are live. No, you're not. We're not. You are now. And we are live. Greetings and salutations, beautiful beans. And thank you so much for joining us here today as we talk about character creation. Matan, how are you doing? I am great, Janet. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm very excited talking about characters because obviously everybody in the world building space is telling stories is using characters, right? D&D characters, RPG characters, but also, um, uh, how do you say it? Like novel characters, ev every setting has characters in, right? So I'm really excited to dive into this today. Can you tell me just a little bit about how you got into D&D? Because it's a really charming story. Well, oh, what, D&D originally? Um, I used to play, I didn't used to play, it's not true. Uh, in middle school, I, um, I saw a bunch of people from a completely different um, class playing D and D, and I had only heard of it tangentially until that point. And it that, it was that point which I said, I got. They seem to be having so much fun, and I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. I don't know these people. I've only ever seen them around school. I don't. I gotta, and I just. <laughs> Uh, at, at one of the at one of one recess or another I just went up to them and I was like you know what I'm in I don't know what what you're doing it seems fun I I want to go in <laughs> amazing and and, and but we're 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 still friends to this day which is I don't know like 25 years later or more I, I'm old now I don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome D, &D. Yeah. making friends yeah, no. Breaking boundaries, is. all that good stuff. Oh, I love that. And uh, you uh, you like creating characters so much. That's one of the reasons that we did this particular stream that you created Eldritch Foundry so everyone can create characters. And by the way, folks, there is an Eldritch Foundry raffle going right now, exclamation point raffle to take part in that. So tell us a little bit about Eldritch Foundry. Like where did that come from? Just before we get into our into our main section. Uh, sure. Um, so we started that up a couple years, well, more than a couple years, like five years now. It's been a while. Uh, so five years ago or so, um, I, uh, a good friend of mine who became my partner in this business, uh, Isaf, um, he started up a D&D campaign. We were both pretty bored with our life. Our kids were getting a bit older and we figured out we can start doing stuff that isn't just day to day. Um, yeah. And he started up a new campaign. I was like, you used to play. Do you want to join? And I hadn't played in years at that point. Uh, to which, of course, I said, yeah, man, count me in. Um, and one of the very first characters I wanted to build was a dwarven gunslinger. And there are no good dwarven gunslinger minis out there at all, at all. And I looked around and I searched and I couldn't find one and I tried to customize one and I couldn't even do that in a good way. And that was sort of the point where I turned to him and said, listen, I think there's something to, something to be done in this space. Uh, at the time, we thought it would be super easy. Not true. <laughs> Not true at all. Uh, but we went ahead and did it, and so we raised some money, and we and we started the, the business together. Uh, and we've been failing forwards uh, ever since. Pretty much. <laughs> That's a lovely way to put it. So, um, yes, I buried the lead there. This is, of course, Matan Gilat. Matt, call him Matt, please. Um, and uh, he is the director of Eldritch Foundry. Is that correct? CEO, I think it's called. CEO, director, overlord. Eldritch Lich God of Eldritch Foundry, um, who, of course, is responsible for all of those wonderful minis that we keep show showing you, who is responsible for the wonderful raffle that we have going right now, exclamation point raffle, um, a man so obsessed with characters that he created a, a mini product, a mini making product so that you can create your own. Uh, so where do you get started? when you're creating a character? Or is it different from character to character? Folks in the chat, also please weigh in. I can't wait to hear where your inspirations come from. Uh, so for me, the I usually start with sort of a concept, um, uh, 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 something that seeks into to the campaign we're running. I It's usually something weird because I don't like to fall into tropes. 
Um, so it's usually trying to figure out sort of an interesting character that has an interesting story that can fit into the campaign, but also make it a bit weird. Uh, yeah. so, so that's usually how I go about things. Um, so for instance, my current character, um, which is a pugilist, which is a homebrew class, which I simply adore, cannot uh, give it enough praise. Um, the, the, I, since we're running Tomb of Annihilation, it's in Chult. It's, it's essentially fantasy, like Vietnam, back in the happy old days of the Vietnam War. Pretty much terrible, terrible continent. Just, I, yeah. hate, I hate Chult so much. So, <laughs> so the idea behind that, this character, if you've ever seen American Gangster, it's that. It's, okay. it's Frank Lucas. It's so, essentially that. He's out there. He wants to get drugs. He wants to get his supplier of drugs from somewhere in the continent. He, he has no idea where he's going. And he's somehow s- stuck now trying to figure out the Tomb of Annihilation because it's his life now. Yeah. Amazing. So do you find that a lot of your inspiration comes from, from movies when you're creating characters, from sort of iconic characters within movies? It's usually sort of a, a, a mix between, uh, I, l- like most people in this, you know, in our space, uh, I read a lot in weird stuff. Um, so Yay. it's, yeah, so obviously I steal a lot of my ideas from better people than I. Um, so from books or, or movies or TV shows or anything that is just, amusing to me at, yeah. at, at any given moment yeah absolutely. Uh, but yeah I, I i am not a great writer personally i usually just sort of steal things and, and make a mishmash of whatever until it sort of builds a story that i can i can work with. yeah absolutely uh robert fair is absolutely with you they say uh i tend to get my inspiration from all over the place books films and gaming i think for so many of us it's the same like it's, I want to play a character that's kind of like this, but with my own spin, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, like, it's, that's it's, so often where it comes from. It's usually something that, that seems like fun, so, and, and, and can be an interesting story. So, American Gangster, wonderful story. I love that movie so much. I, I especially love the beginning of it because it is such an iconic gangster that comes that is just driven he knows what he wants to get and it's not it it makes for an interesting story and the interactions you can have with him he's not so obviously an evil character but yeah he can be cooperative and that is i think the most important part of characters in a campaign somebody you can play with Absolutely. You've hit on three really important ingredients there, I think. The one is fun. And I think that sometimes we can get so wrapped up either in the rules when we're playing characters, in our own heads when we're creating games, where we're creating character options, or in stories, we can get so wrapped up in the plot that we forget that element of I want to have fun. I want to have fun with this character. Like, I want to be in the head of a character that is enjoyable, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things that when I started up playing again, yeah, I I fell in love with the idea of weird characters to the point where I made characters that were so suboptimal that the story, super fun, the character itself, a joy to play. But once you you try to do something that the character is supposed to do, it just falls short. And that sort of breaks the fun of it. Um, so don't get me wrong, I don't try to optimize every last inch yeah. of a character. Some people enjoy that, by the way. I, I Oh yeah, less, absolutely. Less so. Min maxes. Yeah, it's it's yeah. fine. Everybody has their own way. Um, but if the character doesn't do that. Kind of sucks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which sort of gets us on to the question, how important are skills for a character? 
Well, it's mostly a question. So when you build a character and the story of the character, it has it has a theme, right? Um, yeah. So Frank obviously knows drugs. So for me, that's medicine. He should have some skill in medicine. Not because he's a practitioner of medicine, but if, you know, somebody ODs, he needs to know how to you know, get him up and get him out the door or yeah, know absolutely. what he's playing with. Um, or, or, or you're supposed to be intimidating. It is the skills of the character should reflect what the character is good at. Yeah, and that's a great way of foreshadowing background as well, right? Like, yeah. if you see a character and the first thing they're doing is patching someone up, you know that there's medics somewhere in their background, right? Right, and also, it's they're sort of integral to the character itself. Um, yeah. Some characters more than others, but always it is something that the character is supposed to shine at. So, yeah. um, what, like Dragonlance novels and the old, I don't know how old are they. Are there new ones? I, I, I've fallen short of them. But there were, there were always the characters, you know, when there is something that is relevant. So, so there is a lock in the way. You know yeah. who you need to reach out to. If yeah. there is magic, you know, Reislin is our guy. That's, yeah. he, he's, he's a terrible person, but he's the only one we know how to fix the thing. Yeah. Um, so it's always, a th so you need to, to know what the character is good at so you can make it useful. Otherwise, yeah. all you have is sort of a bag of hit points. Yeah, totally. Another really good point that actually you you touched on there, I'm so glad you did, is that uh, char competency is a great way to make your characters likable. Um, so think of Dr. House, right? He's quite unlikable in practically every way, but the fact that he is so good at diagnostics makes him really compelling. It makes him likable for the audience. Um, and that's a great way if you have a character that's a bit like, oh, I'm a lone wolf. I don't like anyone. Rah, 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 rah. Uh, making him good at something is actually going to make him more appealing to the other members of the party, whether he's an NPC or a PC, right? Yeah, because he's the guy that you, you or gal, that you go to. He's, he's your go-to. Even if he's terrible, but he is great at what he does. Um, the inverse, by the way, is also, a, it's, it's sort of, a way to, to showcase why a character that is terrible and what it's supposed to be good at is interesting but also not fun to play with. I hmm. we used to play with uh, a robe who was the worst at sneaking, yeah. the worst. Um, by the way, not because the character was bad at it; it had all the right pluses. Yeah, the character, the you know who was driving the character just was terrible at it. Yeah. I I happy. sneak I I sneak across the open plane. I was like how? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone sees you. There's there's nothing out there for you to hide behind. There has to be some element of story in this, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh it's terrible by the way when that happens. So um forgive me. I'm going to bring up something that doesn't exist. Game of Thrones series eight. Uh, you have all of these genius tacticians and experienced military people, and Ooh. they keep putting their armies outside the castles. And you're like, some general should have figured this out. Like Tyrion Lannister, who's supposed to be Mr. Smarty Pants, should have gone, maybe we shouldn't put the armies outside the gate, right? And that is such a, <laughs> Lena Richards says, cries in failed TV show. Yes, exactly. That is such a great example of how the person driving the character, like you just said, was just not, not making the right choices, not making the choices the character would well, that, have made. That episode broke me, by the way. I, I stopped watching after that episode and I was like you know what I'm done my heart can only go can only break so far I'm done I'm done I'm done with the series uh no it's just it's stupid it's it, what's the word Matt Colville always uses uh, ver verisimilitude right that's the word yeah how, verisimilitude how, yeah that's the word so how how well immersed it is and and if it's just you just break everything if you yeah. make just 
it's okay to make mistakes. Mistakes happen to everyone. Fog of war is a thing in real life and in games, but it's just terrible when it's yeah. just it makes you it, it it the 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 fun part of playing and the fun part of reading and the fun part of is is having a world that you can latch on to and and it makes sense even if it doesn't make any sense but it is internally consistent yeah consistent that's the word um game of thrones the books themselves amazing they work they work everyone is smart it doesn't matter if you're good or bad it's a question of are you doing things wisely or not ned yeah. stark I, I read game of thrones way back in high school yeah oh my god it's been that man that long but I reread them a couple of years back. So when I read them in high school, I was like, yes, Ned Stark, he's the good guy. Why is this happening to him? Unfair. And then I read it again when I was in my 30s. And I was like, yeah, no, he absolutely got what was coming from me. He's an idiot. He, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really good yeah. guy. Made bad choices. Yep. Uh, the system Alternity has uh, a great system, by the way. Alternity 1990. Highly recommended if, uh, if you're looking for space space settings and that kind of thing um it has as its flaws as one of the flaws that you can take for your character it has an honor code and i never understood that until i saw ned stark and i was like ah that is why an honor code is a flaw because sometimes you make really bad choices because of your honor code which by the way really useful character tip <laughs> no it's it's a beautiful flaw don't get me you can build a character, it's a flaw you can build a character around. You can yeah. make it internally consistent. It works. It's a fun character to play. And it's a fun player character to play with and against. But it will make mistakes. You, you know what you're getting into. You, you picked absolutely. this as a flaw. I mean, lawful stupid is, is a thing. Yeah, absolutely. And flaws are so critical for characters. Do you have any favorite flaws that you like to give your characters? I usually like to work between two things. Either my character is too stupid to understand that it's stupid, which is a, a joy, <laughs> or, or it is just pragmatic to no end. I, my current character, I, I don't care. I just, who cares? So that guy's, you know, we pick up an NPC and it's like, yeah, sure, you're a good guy. Go, go scout that thing out. And I was like, no, but he will die. Yes, he will die. I am absolutely fine. <laughs> Screw it. <laughs> pragmatism. Hardcore yeah. pragmatism, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It works. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said about flaws that remain playable. Uh, that keep a character playable. So uh, when I do streamed games, I spend a, a, a many of my characters are not lawful stupid, but joyful stupid. So they're uh, very, very bubbly and happy and kind and, and gregarious, but they're a little bit out of touch with reality. And that's a very fun uh, flaw to play as long as you have somebody in the party that can pull you down. If everybody is like that, then you get Muppets in space, which is a campaign that I essentially have done at one point, right? Are there flaws that you think are harder to play? Well, the, the I think that anybody who's who has a flaw in mind knows what the flaw should be and mm -hmm. how it should be a negative rather than a positive. So like the, the old interview question, I'm stubborn. That can be a good thing, but it can also be a terrible thing. Yeah. And it's a good thing when you when you play it right. And it's a terrible thing for everybody at the table when you just refuse to move or anything. So like I said, we're we're playing Tomb of Annihilation, spoiler warning, you get invading gods in your head. Uh, and they bestow a flaw upon you. Say ah. greed. Mm. You are greedy now. Do not share. Um which, by the way, is a wonderful flaw to take into the Tomb of Annihilation because you get all this gold and nothing to spend it on. You're yeah. in a tomb. You're stuck. Uh, but it, it causes interesting interactions in the party. Yeah. Why are you hoarding all the stuff? Because it's mine now. It's my stuff. I follow. It's mine. You don't get any of it. <laughs> and it's fun to watch people 
get angry but what will we do once we're out of the tomb when we're in our next campaign I was like I people sometimes get actually angry about this rather than character angry yeah that's dangerous and it's dangerous and you need to be able to diffuse that in, absolutely it, it flaws are important I mean it's a character that is amazing at everything and cannot fail or fails so rarely is not interesting. It's like yeah, Superman. There's no, there's no drama to their choices, essentially. Exactly. I mean, for me, Superman is the most boring superhero. The most boring. It, none of his choices matter. You have yeah. to bring in ridiculous things to make him have even a remotely interesting story. He's, people love him. He's like the all-American boy, but he's, to me, he's boring. Batman yeah. is interesting. Batman is a dude in a suit. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then it's not just the flaws. It's also it's not, not just the sort of character flaws. It's the fragility as well. It's the fact that, you know, they can die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, again, for Batman. Yeah. What, his flaw is bladed object, just yeah, his floor is anything that kills a regular human. Yes. Uh, somebody just mentioned, I love it when characters get in over their head. Oh, that was Robin Fayer. Um, I would say Batman is a great example of that. He often ends up fighting these somewhat super beings. Uh, Justice League, he's the only dude in a suit. Everybody else is like a freaking god or something. Um, and he's just there like, I have training and money. That's how I got onto this team. Yes. And that makes him... <laughs> you know that's why he's one of the favorite characters of that universe because it's not just the moral the moral stuff it's the fact that you know he is way more fragile there's so much more at stake he's more human he's more mortal he's more interesting he, his choices matter superman's choices superman's basic choice is do i punt this into the sun or not yeah which is like that's that's pretty much it and batman has actual choices he needs to to decide what he does. Um, yeah. And again, that's sort of the thing about flaws. They should be interesting. They should not be gameless. They should not be annoying. Like, yeah. stealing from everybody in the party. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It, um, uh, there's a lot of horror stories about, oh, my rogue, then my rogue woke up in the middle of the night and stabbed the paladin in the face, the end right yeah like oh i'm a flawed character uh do you have any thoughts about making characters that work well with others obviously it's especially important for rpgs well mostly it's having a character that has a motivation for actually being there i mean most of the time people have this character that you run into the the problem when somebody plays a character that does not have a motivation for joining the thing yeah. why are you here well you're my friends and we're doing the campaign so my character joins in it's like yeah but, but why why Just, is your character here what's brought yeah. them to this dangerous table right uh, yeah and 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 it's exactly that it's it's the story of the character it needs to have a reason behind it it's sort of like why people like edgy characters it makes sense nobody goes out adventuring if he has like a wife and three kids and a successful winery. Yeah, yeah man, I'm not going to go slay the dragon. I'm going to pay somebody to do the thing. Right, I'm going to stay at home and drink wine. My life, is, my life is great. You do the dangerous thing. Um, but, but the character needs to have um, sort of something that makes it work with others. Greed, by the way, is a good motivator. Why do you want to do the thing? I want to have treasure, power, or it doesn't need to be insanely convoluted, but it sometimes is. One, one of my earlier characters in the current campaign, which got off so fast due to oh, my dear. mistakes, so fast, um, was like a researcher who oh, yeah. goes out into the, to the jungle to, 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 to get his master's thesis in whatever. Uh, why is he there? He doesn't, an artificer with no attack spell. Just oh, God. Abs yes. I, the idea was that in the first few levels, he would be just terrible and clueless and would grow into an effective artificer. I sort of assumed 
would have more than more time, but no, no, nope. no, no. He took an hour to the knee. He he, he stayed a night in a hag's uh, cup. Oh, me. oh yeah, you don't do that twice. Uh, <laughs> that is unfortunate. <laughs> I, I I fall. I I actually thought they were nice people, and I was dead wrong. Ever all the the rest of the party was like, yeah, we're gonna go kill the whatever that the hags send us, and I was like, yeah, no. You you go do the dangerous thing. I'll stay here and, and help them, I don't know, chuck fishes or something. I will artifice. <laughs> I'll, build, I'll build them an indoors outhouse. Something. Turns out you were the one that was made into something. <laughs> yes. Yes. So one of the one of the most important things then is is really motivations, I think, when we're talking about characters working well together. Um, and a lot of that uh, characters have a lot of motivations, right? Hopefully your party, one of the motivations will be solve the thing, find the MacGuffin, do the quest, save the princess, whatever, whatever that main adventure hook is. And then hopefully whatever that main campaign hook is that you've got them excited about, uh, or in a book where you're sending them in the plot, that is one of their motivations. Right. But I think that other motivations are also really critical, like, um, not just the main story motivation, but personal motivations. We've mentioned things like greed. Um, are there other motivations that you you like in characters that you like seeing in characters? Um, usually what I like is characters that that it's it's always essentially most motivations that I can think of other than like the noble ones that you know I want a better society. I want to help my community. I want to to to, to rid the land of the tyrant, whatever. Yeah, um, or I'm on a I, holy quest. Exactly. Right. Um, I I personally am not a big fan of those because it feels holier than thou. Mm. And there are people out there that are exactly like that, that, that work internally for the greater good, whatever happens. Um, they're rare, pretty rare. Um, most people have internal motivations that are variations in greed. I mean, at least in my mind, I mean, bettering yourself through knowledge is a version of, of greed in a way. You want this for yourself. You want to be smarter. You want to know more. Um, you want to help your family. You, It's all variations thereof. Um, that might be a bit too philosophical. But the idea is that I like characters that have um, sort of an internal idea of where they want to go that yeah. may shift over time and it's probably best i mean the most boring lord i love lord of the rings but its characters are paper thin oh absolutely yeah because they don't grow they don't change none of them actually move from beyond being good aragorn does good because he is good the hobbits need to take the ring because that's what they need to do but they don't move beyond that and i mean that, that's say why i loved game of thrones so much the characters shift Tyrion started out as an absolute bastard only cares about it for himself and he grows into a character that is interested in personal growth yeah but also because it helps other people and Absolutely, helping yeah. other people becomes something that is important to him. He, he, and, and that is an interesting story to tell. Totally. When you are creating characters, because uh, we're of course talking about character development and character arcs, um, a lot of writers tend to know where their characters are going to go and they will seed a flaw, knowing that sometimes that is the flaw that will either sink or the character will either sink or swim with, right? Either it's a heroic flaw that they can't get over or it's a flaw that they will get over. Um, how, how does it work in your experience with RPGs? Because obviously there's, there's more dynamic elements than just a writer in their own head with their characters and their plot and their world controlling everything. Well, for the DM, it's pretty easy. He knows, well, well let's put it this way. It's not easy, it's not true. DMs that run pre-built campaigns like the Watsi ones or whatever know pretty much where things will go and how they shift the Watsi campaigns in my experience are 
written not as well as they can be. Um, homebrew DMs either know exactly where they want to go exactly, and it's all a question of how divergent the paths go until they start Come folding to that point. Them. Yeah. yeah, start folding them back in, or they have no clue where the hell anything is going. They know what the world includes, and just you know, I don't know, blow up the kingdom. Good, good, <laughs> good luck. I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, so it, it's it's an interesting question. I I don't know. I guess it's pretty much a question of um, who you're playing with and who you're and, and what you have in mind. I have yet to have a character that started out with one motivation and with that motivation. And I have never had a campaign that started out like I thought it would and, and ex- even in the general vicinity. Uh, Interesting. We, we, we ran Descent into a furnace in the office a while back and I thought I was playing with good people and the very first thing they go into like Elf Song Tavern or something and to my personal horror they decided to uh, rob, murder, cannibalize. Oh my god. Yes. uh, There's like a Kowatoa princess that's locked up in there and they're like nope, yeah, nope, this is what we're doing. Everybody's shanking her and they have never played before. Oh Never. God. That was the first thing they did. They went up there, they closed the door, they started They went robbing. full murder hobo. Immediately. And they were in they were so happy that they could. They did oh not Im- they didn't imagine this was something they could do. And I was like, you can do anything you want, but oh my god, why are you choosing but this? There will be consequences, right? Well, uh, to be fair, at least they started in hell, right? Descent into Avidus, for those of you who don't know, is, oh. is a campaign set in hell. Uh, oh no, they went in hell. You started no, them. Up. You, you start, them above. You start in Baldur's Gate. You go to uh, hell later. No, no, they they all of them were like, wait, so there's hell in this world? Yes. How do I sign a pact with the devil? And I was like, you just you're level one characters. What the hell? <laughs> That is hilarious. I love it. The, but they they had a direction and they knew which way they wanted to go with the party, which I guess is useful. Actually, when I played Avernus, um, so I, I was very uh, lucky to play Avernus for Wizards of the Coast. I was uh, on their on their streamed Avernus show for 12 episodes. Um, and so when I was creating the character, I, we were told we were basically pretty much going straight to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go straight to hell because it's a... Uh, it's a, a, a 12 session campaign, right? Each session is two hours. So they wanted to get lots of good time in hell. Um, so I was like, all right, how can I create a character arc? Um, and I, I did it on the theme of found family. So I started out with a character who was very selfish and only cared for themselves. And, you know, gradually they, they had something of a redemption arc, essentially, where they were sent to hell because they were an a-hole that's the nicest way I can say it um and gradually they had this redemption arc where they started to sacrifice themselves for the party who was found family um and I think picking a theme not just picking a flaw but picking really a theme for your for your character arc can be very very useful um because it really helps you create your own character story as well as you know creating the the cumulative story so you end up with stories within stories within a world full of stories do you know what i mean yeah no it makes perfect sense i actually never thought of it like that i mean and i the flaw is what the character needs to overcome the theme is the general vicinity of where you want it to go um the edgy rogue warms up and joins the family the paladin figures out fate isn't all encompassing and you can go against the rules if need be there is you can you can immediately think of like 10 stories just to run off with that yeah yeah exactly and i think that's a really useful way to think of rpg character arcs because uh obviously you can't you can't plan everything that's going to happen in the campaign because you're a player but you can start to think about a theme for the direction you want your character to go and and why so i think after a few sessions that's a that's just a a little tip that i thought i would share with the space um so 
we've talked a lot about the insides of a character. Oh, actually, no, I have one more question about this. Um, curveballs. How do you make characters change? What are some good uh, prodders to make your characters change? And what are some good ways to show that change? Uh, so I was thinking like introducing phobias and flaws on the one hand, and then introducing skills and perks on the other as you show them develop. Well, in our in in the group we we're playing, which has been running for a while now, um, there are two ways that I found that work really well, both when I DM and when I play. The first one is your force chain. Yeah. You take the rogue, he does something stupid, he loses an arm. Not for it's, it doesn't have to be forever and ever. Two, three, four sessions. Nothing more than that, because otherwise the the player feels that you know, his agency has been taken from him. Or you show him how he can get out of that particular hole. But that, say, take his shooting arm. Yeah. He no longer uses a bow. He can't. He only has one arm. But now he has to figure out what it means not to be the bowman. Yeah. Or how he lives with himself. Or why that why did he lose the arm? What yeah. choices did he make that forced that on him? Yeah. The consequences of his actions. So one, you can foist it on him and it can be feasible. It can be physical, or, or like a disability or, or a scar. It doesn't even have to be anything that actually causes in-game disadvantage. A scar, a facial scar on a very charismatic character. He's still charismatic. He's still the face of the group. But now he's not as pretty in his mind as he used to be. Yeah. Um, and how does he deal with it? Um, or you can do something that the character itself needs to decide. You, you put a question in front of him. Like, um, there's a wonderful um, a game, Wasteland 3. Wonderful game, um, which I backed way back when. And one of the very first missions you get when you start out is you need to choose between saving a family that's being assaulted or saving a caravan full of high-tech armor. Yeah. And you can only choose one. Yeah. And if you do that, the other one is lost forever. Yeah. You never get to do the thing. So do you leave helpless people to die or and go just for the, the loot? Or do you lose the loot and know you will be weaker in the beginning of the game just so you can feel good about yourself? Yeah. And that is a wonderful question to put in front of a player. Yeah. You have limited time. What do you do? What and choices how do you, you make? Yeah. And how do you live with yourself afterwards? Yeah. That's so insightful. That is so insightful. Um, I have to say, I made a, I made a video a while ago about... Um, interesting plot hooks that you interesting plot moments that you can throw to like that are very character uh focused and i use both of those uh as examples the one is taking away your hero's toys uh and seeing how they cope and the other <laughs> one is make them make a choice um and you can also tease secret option number three what's that secret option number three is you have to choose between this and this but if the characters are smart enough they might find secret option number three Oh, okay. Do you see what I mean? You can only use it once or twice, but it's quite like if you have a Sherlock Holmes level smart character, okay. you can let them have secret option number three that nobody else could figure out, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's nice. That actually even plays into their their strength. And then you go off, but then you go off the beaten road and nobody knows where you're going. Yeah, yeah absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It's very scary when players do that, where you're like, I have set up a choice between A or B. And they're like, that's fascinating. Which should we choose? And then the one at the back goes, couldn't we just, couldn't we just walk around both of them and do something else? Just, and the GM just... is sat there going, no! Mm. Yes. Well, well, that's that's what, uh, what's it called? The quantum ogre is for. <laughs> what do I choose? A or B? Doesn't matter. They're both A. Yeah. You'll just go right back. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've talked a lot about the insides of a character, but of course, the outside of a character is also a great way 
to signal a lot of this stuff, the way that they act, the way that they look, and the way that they choose to uh, change the way they look, right? The way they dress, what they carry, all of these things. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, about that? Obviously, somebody somebody who has created something that literally creates the way the characters look. I thought that this is a question I had to ask. So, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, for me, it's very important the way a character looks because it informs a lot of the decisions of how the character acts. Um, at least for me, uh, once I can visualize a character, I sort of know what he feels like. Um, it, when I started out before we had Eldritch Foundry, we, I used to commission artists, I still do, uh, every time for every new character, it's wow. kind of a running joke that I do this. It's like, it's not a waste of money. I enjoy it. I love the art. I never do anything particularly special with it. It just sits in a folder in my computer, but it really helps me describe the character, how it's standing, what it's holding, how how it looks around. It it helps understand it better. I mean, again, like like this character uh, that I'm playing right now, Frank, um, an orc, big guy, intimidating. But well dressed. Think uh, Peaky Blinders. He's always in a suit. He does the thing. He has like the li the little glasses that he takes off before he goes punching somebody. <laughs> but it's it's those little things that you can play around with. And I I I, I don't always start with how the character looks. I sometimes have an idea of what I want the character to be, and then I start playing around with it but I always I have to have a visual representation of the character because it it, it makes it helps me sort of put myself into the mind of the character um, and that's why it was for us very important to have characters that are not the same dwarves are not humans elves are not dwarves Goliaths need to be very different than, say, for balls. Um, yeah. And I mean, for us, the system, we've paid a price on this. We don't push out races as often as I would like to be able to because we put in extra effort on each race that it needs to be different. And if it's not different, then I, I send the studio back to do more work. Um, but yeah, I mean, I always sit down and either with a drawing or with a character builder and I just shift it around and I pose it and I put something in the hand and that doesn't feel right um, until I get just where I want to be. It's either too tall, too bulky, too small, or it just has the thing that it, it carries. Um, and I, uh, it's sort of, for me, it's very important. I mean, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any tips for um, favorite things, uh, favorite props, that kind of thing, things that you really like? Uh, things that add a lot of character? Well, the things, especially if you're building a character in, in a, with a visual representation, and this thing I learned from our studio team, which are, who are all great artists, the biggest thing about a character is its silhouette. The very first thing, if you see it, if sort of, it's a, it's it's night and it's backlit and you don't see all the features, but you can see the outline of the character. It imparts so much. So the biggest thing that break a silhouette are the shoulders, the head, and maybe something it's holding. It needs to to be in a very striking pose, and it needs to be visually different because a person in a suit looks pretty much the same it always looks like you you know how he looks uh, sure. a man in a suit or, or somebody with like the big poofy shoulders yeah. you know exactly what they look like um but if you can strike a pose and you can sort of shift it around it really informs the character um so it's usually the the very first things i do i strike i strike a pose I put on shoulders and head gear, and I just try to sort of see where it goes from here. 
That's so cool. I had never thought of doing silhouette first. I have read so much stuff about characters. I have read books and books about creating characters. I have literally never heard that before. That is so cool. Thank you so much for that, Matan. Like that's that's a nugget I'm taking away with me. Silhouette first. I love that. I freaking it's, love that. You would be, I mean, it's something the studio taught, taught me that by looking at Games Workshop stuff. And mm. they always take the miniatures when I say, this is this looks amazing. And they say, why? What? What looks amazing on that? I don't know. It's amazing. I'm not an artist. I do Excel. What do you, what do you want from me? And they and they they take out everything, they they black out the character, they put it on a wave and stuff. What what looks good there? Tell no. the, the, does the smoke look good? Does the, the smoking thing? The, the pose, the weapon, what? What looks good? What catches your eye? And that is where we start. Wow, that is so cool. Uh, well, folks, just a reminder that we do have a raffle going, exclamation point raffle, to take part in that, where you can win your very own Eldritch Foundry miniature figurine. Yes, you can. Uh, I have to say, we uh, we bought a whole bunch of them uh and uh we were trying out everything on them you have some really cool props we have a guy with a barrel on his back armed with a rolling pin he is one of the most badass little goblins i have ever made and i cannot wait to use him as an npc literally he's going to be in every single campaign that i run from now on angry <laughs> goblin chef hat rolling pin barrel on his back i i to this day have no idea why we did the barrel but it's the stupidest perfect. thing that are just the most fun. I mean, it's perfect. It, it's kind of like um, we wanted to have for uh, for Easter a, a, a bunny because yeah. Easter. Yeah. And and one of our modelers said, you know what a, what the bunny needs? You know what it needs? I'll show you what it needs. And he stuck like a bundle of TNT on the back of the bunny. And I'm like, there you go. Oh, that's, my gosh. That's a perfect bunny. <laughs> it's my it's it's the base I, I have no idea what i'm supposed to do with that but it's like i need i need to find there's like an artificer waiting waiting for that that he just a goblin he sacrifices woodland animal or a druid that just goes a, a, an eco-terrorist druid what does he do it's for the greater good go yep. bunny yeah. To be Go. fair, did you know that this is historically correct? That they used to, um, uh, this is horrible, guys, so I apologize for that. Uh, they used to set cats on fire or put uh, flammables on the back of cats because they knew that they would run back into the city and hide in a familiar place and set the city on fire. It was a siege tactic. I did not know that. Yes, this is a historical thing that actual humans did to one another. No, we did crazy. I mean, I know about World War II and the crazy, crazy shit. People. <laughs> like, um, what was it? Bats with uh, with bombs. Oh, my the gosh. I did yeah. that to, to the Japanese. Oh, my the, gosh. Yeah. The Russians taught dogs to run under tanks. Anti-tank we, dogs. Yeah. That was a thing. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> there's like there's like a bunch of stuff <laughs> that the people did that is just. Terrible. Yeah, people have some horrible ideas. Uh, I think we can leave it there. So yeah, I have to say, um, Eldritch Foundry has some of the most creative uh, assets that I have seen, and I've made some of the coolest NPCs with it. So uh, yeah, I, I have to recommend it. The other thing that I love about what you have is um, you have great posturing. Not you as company, you as like posture your figurines, uh, which means you can get so much character into them. And I think that's such a big thing that people forget about characters. Characters aren't still, characters move. And having them crouch or having them prowl or having them lunge or having them cower, you can show that, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, to this day, one of the proudest things I have in the system is I call it the prone position. We've received a lot of complaints on that, by the way. Uh, but I stand firm. I will die on this hill. It's our prone position. It's the 30 plus where the dude is just like, oh, my back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I threw my back like uh, several months back. Oh. And, and when I came back in, I was like, you know what we need? That. That, that pose is... 
is is necessary because we didn't have we didn't have a prone posi- uh, pose and yeah. system. And I just I, did, I don't want just a character that is just on the ground. It's to me it's boring. We'll probably have one at some point, but not not yet. Um, and, and it's just it's great. And people take that, which I only made pretty much as a gag, um, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. And they make it into such great stuff, really yeah. amazing stuff. We're still missing the sneaky sneak one. The, the sneaky sneak, yeah. The, the, the like old school cartoon sneaky thing. All right, like a pink panther sneak. Yeah. Exactly, that's the one. Uh, we will have it at some point uh, once we finish the... No, I don't want to put a time on it. People will hold me to that. Uh, <laughs> we will have one of those at some point. Amazing. Oh, also, Goddess says it's the prone position, not the crone position, which I thought was hilarious. You know, because it's like, ah! My back! I'm, I, my back! I'm out. You can have advantage when you attack me. I'm, <laughs> I need a moment. <laughs> hilarious. Uh, well, we have some questions from the audience. And folks, remember, if you would like to ask a question, you can do that by clicking the flaming anvil underneath the chat window and redeeming a question with a single flaming anvil point. Yes, you probably gained one just uh, sitting here listening to us. So Extremsy says, what did you do before you started Eldritch Foundry? And did it help you start your business? Uh, well what i did i am an economist by training i used to work in our local federal reserve after that i i did a whole bunch of stuff i uh i i worked um so after the bank i worked in um a research firm um doing mostly governmental research for government offices very boring stuff uh after that i went on to a startup company where we built well essentially a sort of a um a business suggestion engine until that startup tanked absolutely completely we they took our team stuck it into a um into a media company where i started up a data journalism um department department i guess it's called um, and then I decided that what I wanted to do in life was data science because I have, uh, I started my, I, I, did, I started my PhD in economics and I did all nice. sorts of, it's, yeah, I like, I like that. One day I will finish my PhD, not soon, but one day. Um, so I knew a lot of statistics and econometrics and all stuff, all sorts of stuff like that. So I went to data science in, uh, in that and it turned out that I hated it oh oh, oh so dear. much oh, oh no oh, oh so much great salary worst job uh mm-hmm. not for me which was one of the reasons that that caused me to say I hate my I used to sit in my car like before I went into the job and into, into work for like 30 minutes at a time just pepping myself up to go you can oh do this <laughs> yes it was terrible time was that bad uh, yeah no it, it's it's fine the work is fine i knew what i was getting into i just didn't understand how much i hated it yeah. um and that happens it's fine you can change your life it's okay yeah, absolutely um so yes it did help because i have quite an un, quite a bit of background in finance and economics and how to build business plans and how to do the excel work and powerpoints and all of that which is super useful when you build a business plan and go out and ask people for money to help you do the thing. Um, no, I I wish it would be more helpful because running a business is, you know this, it's hard work and making sure everybody. My biggest thing in life is be, is being able to say, everybody's salary is paid this month. We I can rest. This month I did good. And that is so terrifying not to be able to do that. That is the the, the mo- that that is what keeps me up at night. So uh so yeah, it does help. It helps. I think uh whatever you do in life, I mean you say you did this or that, Matan. My my background is the weirdest. I like to think of myself as the argument for multiclassing. Uh I've got <laughs> 
uh, historical music, opera, performance, writing, archaeology. Uh, there's all sorts of random crap uh, acting in in my background as, lo as well as a huge amount of other bits and bobs. But it's all helpful. Like, I use it all. Uh, it's just sometimes I use it in ways I don't expect. There, there is my partner has an MA in philosophy in Far East. In in Far East philosophy, cool. is is BA is in something even weirder than that. And he did project management and like Deloitte um, after yeah. graduating, and. The weird ones are the ones that have the most interesting thoughts on how to do things. Yeah, and I think that goes for your characters as well. <laughs> you see, it all connects. Basic Dragon says, I usually get my inspiration from music and then other media adds to it. Do you have any albums uh, where a character's popped into your mind or do any of your characters have a soundtrack? No, none of my characters have soundtracks, but, and I am not a particularly musical person myself, but sometimes I draw, I, not sometimes, I, I get far too involved in some things. So for instance, uh, a while back, World of Warcraft did uh, the Jaina's Lament thing. I don't even, Daughter of the Sea. Oh, yeah. Which to this day, I sometimes just listen to that. I love it. It's on my car, it's on my car CD. Uh, it's a beautiful soundtrack and it fits in. And if I ever have a nautical campaign, that is the soundtrack to go with. Nice. Um, or Carl McGuinness and his sea shanties. I just, I don't know. Lately, I've just, I've been listening to sea shanty. It's, my wife hates it. <laughs> hates it. But there it is. There we go. I think it's very personal what moves you particularly. Um and uh, I know that some people find music incredibly inspiring, Basic Dragon. So you're you're definitely not alone on that. Um, yeah, I uh, I find music more inspiring for settings than I find specifically for characters uh, or for character moments. So if I already have a character in my head, I'll be listening through and I'll be like, oh my god, my character would totally do this at this moment in in the in the movie, right? Which is I think for a lot of people a very helpful way of visualizing character moments. Yeah. Yeah, there's specific music, specific sort of a, a crescendo. It it really it, it helps cement sort of the cinematic moments that you're looking for. Absolutely. Stiltis says, "How do you make a well-developed and powerful character interesting without making the process feel forced?" I do, I never set out to make a powerful character. I usually I usually set out to, to make a character that has an interesting story and has one or two things that it is very good at. But it doesn't it usually comes at an expense of other things. So interesting. Um, if my my old artificer who was a cowardly wretch and his only thing he would do in in combat in the beginning was drop prone and find a rock to hide behind. I'm not kidding. The, the group hated it. And he casts spells. He did the thing. But the first thing he does is drop prone. Drop because... and roll. Exactly. And people, and, and it's and it's so weird. It's so unheroic fantasy. What the mm -hmm. hell are you doing? You should be fighting. No, I should be surviving. Absolutely different. So the idea is to make a character, at least in my mind, the idea is to make a character that does what it wants really well. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be strong. In fact, it's more interesting if it's not in, in, in other areas. Absolutely. I think that uh, well-developed characters take time to come across. So if you have a character that is complex, you cannot drop all of that complexity in one session or in one scene, right? If you want to have a character that feels well-developed like a human, you can't you can't deliver that in one exchange. And so I think that the trick there is in the different scenes in the RPG or in the different scenes in your book or your movie or whatever you're rolling to reveal those different facets slowly to maybe hint at a motivation, to hint at a backstory, to hint at a skill or somebody has something, an unusual skill that doesn't necessarily fit 
with the perception of them. And then later it becomes clear that actually they're a much more complex person than you thought. You thought that they were, you know, just a tank, but it turns out that they they used to be this and they have this and actually they have a secret love of that. And that makes them feel very well developed and dynamic. But you can't drop it all at once. And I think that's the the danger. That's when it feels forced is when you try and rush that reveal. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's 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 sort of I love the new Star Wars movies, mm. but I get exactly why people didn't like them. Because Ray, unlike Luke, Luke doesn't start out all that powerful. He's just a dude that figures out things. Ray pretty much immediately oh, knows yeah. how to fight. She's amazing. She takes the lightsaber and she's an ace at it. Boom. And yeah. I love the movies. She's a great character, but also she's a terrible character. It's yeah, it's... she has that Mary Sue. She has a little bit the same problem that uh, Superman has, right? Like, yeah, Ray is sort of good at everything, and pretty, yeah. and strong, and can function on her own or as part of a team. And unfortunately, that makes her a little bit less compelling than we would like. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, which is a shame, by the way. I, 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 I had really high hopes for the movies when, when the first one. And I even had high hopes for the second one, the third one that again broke me. Yeah, for on season eight. Yeah, yeah. Kind eight, of that eight. Again. Uh, oh, no. oh, oh. <laughs> let's let's not relive old traumas. <laughs> they will give us character flaws, Matt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Demetrius has informed me that Laria Enel won the raffle, but has not yet claimed their prize. Please, please, Laria Enel, say something, or we will have to redraw the raffle. And speaking of raffles and summer camp and all that good stuff, I thought I might tease some stats of what's been going on. Of course, Matan is a sponsor. Eldritch Foundry is a sponsor of summer camp. So I'm sure they will also be pleased to hear that you guys are incredible. 845 entries submitted as of the beginning of this stream. This is in the first 48 hours, can I be clear? 845 entries from 387 competitors so far, and we haven't even hit the weekend. 501,000 words. Guys, you have been so busy. Shout out in the chat how many articles you have completed so far. Because we've had one, uh, we reckon it's 2.18 articles per competitor. And I would love to know if that is representative of what we're saying in the chat. Uh, 10,450 words per hour. Can you write that much, Matan? No. And it's like, it's like 1,300 words per competitor, which is also, how do you? Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. You... Guys, you are incredible, right? Aren't they amazing? It's insane. I could never, I could never do that. Never. Uh, chat is coming in. I see six articles from Dinosaur Bob, two from Delian, uh, nearly one from Jesse Sinclair. Double Finn the Morning, two articles working on the third. So you guys are busy. I would like to congratulate some people who have already done 10 articles. They have already won the copper badge. It's day three. It's incredible, right? So Tuaren at Stormborn, Quantum Point, Lena Richards, Moon Raven, Talion, Baron, and Adamal, the Ethnos Beans there. Congratulations, all of you. You have already won copper. That is mind blowing. And congratulations, everyone who has written anything over summer camp, because that is the goal. Now I did float this with Matan, so I'm not I'm not completely surprising him, but I did float it only a minute before we went live. So uh, I thought it would be really nice just before we close the stream, the stream to talk about today's prompt. So prompt number three is a technology article prompt. Somewhere in your setting, describe a medical cure, treatment or breakthrough. So we've had a little a little nexus this year. We've had a building about healing the sick. We've had a medical condition that is feared by some. And then this medical cure treatment or breakthrough. The idea is that you can link them if you want to, but you don't have to just to create some some sort of uh, space in your world where you've got more things created. So my thought for this was things like nanotechnology, 
in a sci-fi setting. Really, really interesting revolution, Borg, all using nanotechnology. And then like in a fantasy world, maybe something as simple as a prosthetic, right? Well, I, I think the I think the best example for something like this would be um, like Mustang Art. Uh, I, I forget them. Um, the lady that did the wheelchairs for... The oh, five. yes, the, the combat battle. The uh, combat wheelchair. wheelchair. That's yeah. the one. Which is, I have not dived in, dived in as much as I, I should. Um, the concept is wonderful. The idea where you can take a disability and make it into something that is a yeah. strength. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think um, especially in in a in a sci-fi setting, it's it's fairly you can you can exactly see where you're taking this. It's kind of like we take nanotechnology and we use it to improve or just take the process that we already do and fix things. It just makes everything we do today better right we yeah. know where this is going it's not we've seen this in movies luke regrows an arm you have the back to tank you have all that um i probably mangled that word by the way i don't no, recall the actual good. yeah that's the thing um in a fantasy setting i think an interesting way would be sort of like um what dr strange does with his magical powers which help him overcome his hands shaking. They don't exactly solve it, but they do improve on it. Um, so that is an interesting way of looking at it. It also seeks, I am, I don't have enough time to read into other um, like fantasy setting or, or like camp, not camp, um, game settings, game yeah. style. Um, but for me, that is a wonderful way of looking at it. Like, um, the the way of the astral self monk which has that solution yeah. you don't need arms you manifest new arms or something like that or possibly uh like taking drugs yeah. drugs take matt uh mercer's sued it does something right it's poison it yeah. is poison but you can repurpose it it's uh adrenaline in too in a too high a dose terrible yeah. thing will straight up murder you very useful or or things of that sort anesthesia generally it's poison anesthesia straight up meant to kill yeah. you but if you can tweak it if you can find that little bit and make it better is an interesting way of looking at it. definitely um, yeah so so to me the best the most interesting thing is taking something that is always thought of as terrible and making it useful uh penicillin mold yeah, absolutely well, th there was that old episode in um what was it called the the when they jumped from realities um oh um i i know the one uh i forget time shifters or something? no i don't i don't I'll remember it later. But there quantum was... leap. No, not quantum no, leap. No. Sliders. Slider. That's the one. Where they Thank jumped you, in... <laughs> Where they jumped into the world, where there was a terrible play going on, and they didn't have penicillin because it's they mold. It. Yeah, it's mold. It's terrible. Who wants to touch mold? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's sort of my how how I love I, that. How I'd go into that. I love that. Dig into something noxious or something bad and repurpose it as a breakthrough. I think that's a really strong contender for a, a way to approach this prompt. Really nice. Thank you. I think with that, I would like to congratulate Drunken Panda, who has won the raffle. Uh, your Eldritch Foundry mini will be on the way. Email me at hello at worldanvil.com and I will make sure that you get that. I would like to thank Matan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Oh, this has been great. It's so nice to get to talk to you about um, about characters and character creation. It, it's been so interesting and you've been you've been so insightful. So thank you so much for that. And now I can see why Eldritch Foundry is, is so great for creating characters. It's because the man behind it is just so passionate about them. We, lo we love what we do. I mean, we, 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 we always wish we could do more. Uh, so even if, if we don't have what we want, feel free to sort of pick us 
we won't have a timeline for it, but we definitely want to do all of it. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I would like to give a big thank you to Secondhand Samurai and Demetrius who have been making everything happen behind the scenes. To all of you who have joined us with your hilarious comments, with your uh, feedback, with your, your information, everything. It's been so much fun reading your comments as we've gone through. Thank you to Voxney Pop, Drunken Panda, Hefe Live, Tika Chan, uh, MFC2TX, who is not making my life easy, Basic Dragon, Extremcy, Dazzly Cat, and Laria Enel for all of your support we are going on a raid our raid shout is light up the forge and we are raiding basic dragon eli quake and sable aradia who are i think doing some summer camp goodness so make sure you stick around for that you'll get 250 anvil points just by take, taking part in the raid so uh yeah definitely worth doing it guys thank you all for joining us today we will see you next week on thursday where we may have a trash my map on friday where we will be revealing the winners of the costume challenge and on saturday yes it is time on saturday next week we will be dropping the next 10 prompts the silver wave they are coming make sure that you join us for early access maximum inspiration massive raffles and all that good stuff and until next time i ask you to grab your hammer and, and go, go, go well build. Build.